What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden. Today we're going to cover something that I found extremely difficult when I was learning Elm, and that's JSON decoders. 99% of what I wanted to do in any type of web development is show some data from a server somewhere. In a lot of web applications, unlike mobile and others, you often will just load data from a server, even if it's local in a machine, just to play with code, just to learn, and it's really hard. Jesse Warden! <laughs> It's really hard when you're learning this functional stuff because they have very strict rules how to do it. And Elm is amazing because it has no side effects, but there's even stricter rules because of those nice, those side effects. So we're going to cover today pretty in depth on building a Elm app from scratch that just does that, loads data from a server. And although a lot of people say, well, that's really part of HTTP, it is, but that wasn't hard for me. What was hard was like, okay, I know how to do Ajax. What I don't know how to do is load that data and just show it on a screen. That's all I want to do is down to this JSON decoder and the really, really strict parser that Elm has. Now there's another way to parse JSON. We're going to show you the decoder just because it's the most common way. And it's probably the most common way you'll look at JSON to get from your server. And when you're done, you'll understand how to do it. But what's interesting is I also think that as you start building your own APIs for your front end, also called a back end for a front end, you'll start to recognize how you want the JSON to appear for your front end, not just so you can show it in a UI and model certain ways it looks, but also how you want it so it's easier to parse and it's easier for you and Elm because some of the runtime exceptions you get for it are sometimes just not obvious when you have large blobs of JSON. It's just better to make it shape from the start. So what I have here is an Elm app starting from scratch. And the only thing we've changed is the browser type. So let's, let's go through line by line first and then we'll slowly build it. The only thing I'm gonna cheat on is I'm gonna draw the table when we're done by copy and paste, because I hate HTML tables from scratch. So I'm just gonna copy paste one I know that works, okay? So we have a module main, and all L maps have to have some kind of module at the top. The ports would have a port in front of it if you're talking to JavaScript. This in particular is just a simple L map. And we import the browser. We're going to do a browser dot element. So sandbox is what you start with because it doesn't have any events. It's really strict and can be very aggressive about optimizations, but we're just doing element. So we're binding to a particular element and that gives us a subscription. But more importantly, we can tell the Elm runtime, go make HTTP calls and let us know when you're done. So it handles all the side effects and all that others. Now the alias right now for model doesn't do anything. It's an empty model. So there's no state other than just an object that never changes. And our init function, because we're using element requires two things. It requires a model that you start with. Like what is your starting model? Very similar. If you're from Redux, this would be the initial state. And then the second is what command should we do when we start the app? Well, in this case, we're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna start the app and nothing happens. I'm gonna make it a button click because I like that. I think it's more obvious. Now our message has nothing. I just put no op. You can put whatever the heck you want. This just means nothing. Do nothing. If you're familiar with void in JavaScript or an action creator that doesn't do anything. That's, that's basically what that is. And an update function would be your reducer in Redux. And this in Elm does nothing. It just literally says, hey, whenever I get a message or something changes, I need you to tell me what the new model should be. We have nothing. So we just <laughs> pass it back in the same, nothing changed. And we don't need to do anything when that changes. The view is literally just a div with sub. So if you look to the right here, screen share here and you can see the HTML there just says sup. It's really teensy weensy. HTML is pretty pathetic. As you can tell, Jesse Warden is amazing at CSS. I'm being sarcastic. Oh, that is our subscriptions, which has nothing. So we're not listening for anything. We're not listening for random numbers or time. We could if we wanted to, but in this case, we're not listening to anything. So we have a model that we don't use. So it gets kind of mad. So we can just change that to an underscore because we don't care about it. Our program is different. Our, our, Browser.element has one additional thing, that's the subscriptions. And we need this because we want to listen for HTTP calls from the browser. So we're not going to use subscriptions particularly, it's just the interface you're required to do. What we're more interested in is init and update now have the ability to issue commands and create a command initially, or if you have some data, do a new command. And that way we can tell the browser in the Elm runtime, do HTTP calls, okay? So this is our basic Elm app. It doesn't do anything but show text. It literally shows text, there is no data. So the first thing we need to do is model our state. And you'll, you'll see a lot of us UI people will immediately go to the view and we'll start thinking like we need to design our state because we know what it looks like. The designer already has design comps and we want to create this 
screen in our heads because that's the most exciting part of our job. If you look at uh, the Elm people, the type background, they want us to start with the types first and model our domain. And then everything just kind of manifest on top of that. If you've got a good understanding of your domain model, your problem, what you're trying to put the types around. it. I personally don't care what you do. <laughs> I, I, I've tried to practice the type way and I think it's great from a design domain driven design perspective, but I always find it fun just to create UIs because I'm still learning CSS and HTML. I've been doing JavaScript forever, but I've always avoided um, doing HTML and CSS because the component people do it for me, right? So we're going to start with the types up here just so we can kind of follow that. So what we need to do is think of a model that we need. And for now, the only real model we need is if there is an existence of people. Now, people aren't always going to exist. We're going to load this list of JSON from the server and it may or may not exist. So if you look at this API gateway I've created on Amazon, AWS Web Services or Amazon Web Services, you can look at API Gateway will link to a Lambda that just sends JSON, right? So there's a little bit of built-in latency. It's not, not that slow at all. It's static, doesn't read from a database. But if we look at this JSON, I'm going to zoom in here. We have about nine items, and each one has a property of ID, first name, last name, et cetera. They're strings. This one is an integer. And some of these properties we don't care about. Like we don't care about these three. We just really want to show their names on the screen, right? And the state that we're modeling is we have no people data. We're loading that people data. The people data worked or the people data failed. And failed could be a bunch of things. It failed to load because the network's down. I deleted my API gateway. The parsing failed. There's a variety of reasons. We're just going to kind of lump those again and say, look, if it didn't work, it didn't work. There's no really I care about how it didn't work. If it didn't, we'll go in there, inspect the reason, and then figure it out from there, right? So we're going to model those four states. How you represent that is really up to you. I'm going to, a lot of people will do a model that's an enumeration. So instead of doing an alias where they actually instance, so if you come from an object oriented programming, an alias would be like new model. I have a bunch of models with different instances, although it's technically a singleton, right? An alias would be instantiating that. Some people like to do discriminated unions or what Elm calls types where you have a series of values. So we could have a model that is a loading and then you could say it's got people or we could say something better. How about people loaded? And then you could say people failed. And so you have those three possible states. We have no people. We're loading those people. The people loaded successfully or the people failed. You notice that's four we're just going to assume we're always in a loaded state. So we could change that model to always be in a loaded state. And what you're now going to see is a bunch of compilation errors when we run. So I'm, I'm using Elm Live right now. And it's just very similar to a lot of Webpack configs where it looks locally at your compiler. And it every time you save a file, it constantly compiles. So if you look to the left here, it's going to refresh the screen with the same stuff we'll see down here from an error perspective. And I have a problem with a terminal because you constantly have to scroll down to see the latest error. It's just not really helpful. So I'm going to hide this. And what we're going to do instead is just watch the browser when things change, okay? So from this perspective, what we're interested in is we have uh, our state kind of model. We're going to initially be loading. So when we first start the app, you are in a loading state. So let's visualize that and change that to be a little bit more accurate. You'll see how it's underlined here. It's not bad that you're not using it, but in functional programming, it's very often you'll get parameters you just won't use. And so it's very common to just go underscore. It's using Rescript and Elm, F Sharp, a lot of other languages. But in this case, we actually want to use it. And so we're going to use that orange to indicate we probably should kind of model visually. And this is just because of my UI background. I want to kind of see it. So let's case on that model here and understand we have either a loading or a people loaded or a people failed. So now we have a people failed. For the view for each one, we're just going to do a simple div, no attributes. The only text inside of it is be like loading. And we'll copy pasta coding for the win. Loaded. Yay. Failed. And when we go to our UI, you can see that it's always now going to be in a loading state until we actually change that model to be a different state. And why would it be a different state? Well, it's either loaded the data or it did not. So how do we load the data or not? Well, we have to have some kind of button to trigger that. So let's put a button at the very top here. 
and we'll get this into a component. So already we're going to start refactoring on the fly here. This is a very, no TDD, no, no domain different design, just feeling it as we go, having some fun. So we're going to call this a people table and we're going to pass in a model and this function, we're expecting some kind of HTML back, right? So I'm going to tab this over a bit. And in our model, we're going to have a div at the top here. He's kind of like our parents. We, we sit in this div and we're going to have um, a div title. So let's do an H1. People, comma. Below that, we want a button to trigger this whole thing. Reload. And below that, we want our people table and we have to pass in a model. So we have three components. Now we haven't imported H1 and button. So you can see that it's like, I don't know what this is. I can't find it. Is it a variable? No, it's not a variable. It's a function. It's part of HTML. Now I'm really bad at HTML CSS, but even I know that H1 is a tag in HTML. And as a function, you have to import it to use it. The next is button, same thing. I'm not that good of a web developer, but even I know that button's there. So as soon as you do it, you can see it off to the left there. We have a reload and a people title. So far, so good. We can have our title, we can reload it, and below it, it'll change the state of whatever that is. Now, when I say change the state, it's not changing really anything. You click the button, nothing happens. To do that, you need to have the button have a click handler. So if you're familiar with JavaScript, you know, jQuery, React, you have a click handler, an Angular, same thing. We have to do some kind of event. So we're going to go to HTML events. That's where those kind of things are stored. And all we really care about for now is the on click. So we're going to just import him instead of like the whole thing, right? We're not going to pleat the whole thing. We're just, we just want one function from it. Very similar to import in Python where you import just functions. We're going to do the same thing. So now we have on click. Let's make the button do something. So in his attributes, he's got an on click. Now, when you do an on click, you have to dispatch an action. So if you're from a Redux, you dispatch an action. Hello, Redux store, something happened. It's called an action creator or dispatch to the store. In this case, we're doing the same thing, except an Elms version of it, it's a message. So we have to dispatch some kind of message, something happened. So we're going to keep no up here. We want to say, get people. So when you refresh, we want you to go get the people. So every time we click, get the people, get the people, get the people. And so we're going to literally set that up. When you click, get the people. So we hit save, we click reload. So far, so good, this get people. But there's an issue, is that get people doesn't actually do anything. And the reason is, is that there's no change of state. So let's case on this message that we're not using. You see how it's orange? The reason most time people in Elm, when they create a new message, they expect a compilation error. We didn't get one because we're not even using it. This is an advantage of Elm where if you use any type of message or discriminated type union or a type, it's going to make sure that you handle all aspects. If you don't even do that, this is where your unit tests come in, your end and test say, look, we're not even getting the basics here. I expected reload to like change the screen eventually. That didn't happen, right? So we're going to do the most common thing that you do in case on the message. We say case message of. So that means it's going to be one of many things. No op. That's where I don't want you to do anything. Just return your original model and return no command. Don't do anything. If I click this, do anything. So in this case, no op means no operation. It means don't do anything. It's just a very common way to say things, no op. It's a functional slang term. And my tabs are atrocious. All right, forget people. You can see it's still red because I haven't done them all. I'm supposed to do two. It wants two possibilities to keep people. When I do get people, that's where I want you to do some interesting stuff. First, the model is no longer whatever it is before. It's loading regardless of where you came from. So we're already starting loading. We don't care. We know that every time you click people, you got to get into a loading state. You might have old people. You haven't refreshed from the server for a while. We might have a failure. Maybe things started working again. Or you're already loading. We don't care. We want to do a, was it a, a LIFO queue, last in, first out. So if you have five HTTP requests, you want the most recent, right? So that's what we're going to do. And our command, we actually don't want to do none. We actually want to do something. We want to load some people. So let's look. For now, I'll show you command none. So you can at least see that we've got our compilation good. So now when we click reload, it's going to run this, but it's not going to do anything. It's just going to change the state. 
to loading. If you wanted to see that initially, we could say people failed. Save. You can see failed, but if I click reload, it changes the state. So we're changing our state, which is good. We're not actually doing anything. What we want to do is the HTTP call. So let's do the HTTP call. This is where things get really easy and really hard. HTTP makes you feel really confident because the API is gorgeous, but the actual decoding part is where the API gets really hard and you get confused because you're like, did I do HTTP wrong? No, you are amazing. The, the, the decoder API is really hard. But we're going to do some modeling data after that so you can see why you have to do that. So let's load people. Now this function doesn't exist. I'm going to put it right below the update because that's where update stuff happens. And we're going to do an HTTP, which isn't really imported. So let's go import it first. To do the HTTP, what you need to do is a get. Now, git takes a few parameters here. It takes a record, really. If you want to see it, we'll go to Elm Lang. Whenever you don't understand how to look at things, they change the UI. What you can do is go to the, um, the docs and you go to the package docs. And here you search for Elm HTTP, the Elm slash indicates it's like an official API. There's other libraries which are fine too. In this case, we're looking for Elm HTTP, that's popular. The other ones are Elm Core, which actually has a lot, okay? So we're looking for Elm HTTP. If you go to the HTTP itself, then look at the Git, that's what we're gonna do. So we need this record that has two parameters. The first is the URL of where your HTTP is. And our, ours is our API gateway for Amazon Web Services. We're gonna paste that in. That's gonna give us our JSON. The next step is the hard one. Why I made this whole video and it took me 16 minutes to get to it. And that is the expect. What are you expecting back? Now there's a variety of things. You could expect nothing, I don't care. Some Git APIs kind of don't really follow the rest back and don't really get anything. But sometimes they might be getting the status of something. Something as simple as an HTTP 200 means everything is okay. Maybe you're checking the operation of something that's read only, that's fine. Most of us web developers call gets because we're expecting data back, right? And so that's what we're doing here is we're expecting some kind of JSON. So you can expect strings. That's fine too. You can expect risky things and parse it yourself. We're just going to do JSON. So we're going to say HTTP expect JSON. JSON what? What happens when you get JSON back? What happens when this actually works, right? Well, you need to have a message. It's yet another dispatch. So if you come from Redux, something happened that could affect the model, the state of your app. You need to tell us what that is. So we need two parameters here, but I'm gonna make it look like one. The first is, they say get text, right? Well, we didn't get text. What we really did was got people. So we started, said, hey, go get the people. And then Elm's like, I got the people. Now, it, there's no guarantee it actually got the people. I could have my internet off. The JSON could be foobarred. It could send back as XML because they're trolling me. Who knows? What we need to do is identify, this is really a result. And there's two things that come in a result. If you are not familiar with Elm or functional programming in general, unless you come from like OCaml or F Sharp, right? Functional programming doesn't have try catch. There's no, it's very similar to Go and, or Lua where it doesn't, like Lua kind of does, but. There's no try catch. There's no two ways to program. We write a bunch of code and then an error has a completely separate path. Every single thing is a function, which means that every function either works or it doesn't. Now, most things always work. Like one plus one, we don't need to write a try catch for that, right? We have types that guarantee we can't accidentally pass in a one, for example, or a float when doing integer math. But HTTP is different, right? It could fail. Well, not necessarily. It's a function. It's pure. It's going to give you a command back. In Elm, when you get a result, you need to look at that result and see did it work or not. So that result is container, very similar to a promise. You look inside to see what happened. In our case, our result is one of those two things. See that an HTTP error, right? Or it's our people. And that's fantastic. What are, what are people? What does that mean? Well, we haven't modeled that yet. And this is why a lot of the type people want you to model it first, right? Reasonably easy to model. So I know programming tutorials are all about, don't say the word easy. It's easy for you, not for the people learning. Trust me, if you've never done modeling, you're going to look at this and go, dude, this is like naturally normal. Okay, cool. So I like to organize my types at the top right next to init. So we're going to model this. We're going to put type people and we're going to put an alias because you can create many one of these. So think of this as an array that you can create multiples. Imagine if you had a class from an object-oriented program, you're wrapping a list. This is the same thing. 
Most important thing, which I always get wrong, spell it right. <laughs> Pia poll. Okay, there we go. So it's a list of people. So we're going to put a list of person. Okay, well, what's a person? Well, this one is also an alias and a person. So we're kind of going backwards here. We can also start from the front. I'll wind you back. A person is just a JavaScript object that has these property, name, value, pairs. A name, always a string. Value could be anything. And we're going to type that in Elm because it can't be anything in Elm. It has to be a very specific thing. These we can map in our head pretty easily. ID would probably be an integer. You never have an ID of 1.2. It wouldn't make any sense. Like ID 1, 2, 3. It's, we're starting to see a pattern here, right? So it's ID. The strings are for the names, the emails, the genders, the IP addresses. We're only going to model these, these three because that's all we want to do for just simple display right now. So we're going to say a model, a type alias a person is going to have an ID that's an integer. So we have a record. It looks like a record or an object in JavaScript. But this is actually a definition of what it's going to be. So if you've, from an object-oriented background, this would be a class with its instance properties that are going to be populated when you instantiate it from the constructor. Very similar concept. We have a new person. It's going to be expect an ID. It's also going to expect a first name. And we're going to name it like we want. So I'm going to use camel case here to clearly differentiate between this Python-looking stuff, right? First name is a string. Last name is a string. And you know what? For the heck of it, let's do email. String, because the data types are easy. It's strings, gender, string, and that's it. We're good. We have a basic modeled person. So this maps in your head. This ID would match to this. This first name would match to this, and last name. Now I say your head because you're going to have to do some parsing yourself to map these two things. A lot of architecture will kind of categorize this stuff because it goes through layers. They'll say things like DTOs or data transfer objects or value objects, also known as VOs. And this is very similar to basically value objects. This would be your, your object that comes from a server that just has data, no behavior, no methods, right? Very similar to this. This JSON doesn't have any functions on it or class. It's just a person. If you decide to give it behavior later in an object-oriented code base, you could do that. React, you would take these people and give them things like calculate their balance and things like that. In a functional world, that's all functions. So these types and VOs, they have a one-to-one -one relationship. But we still have to parse it because it might not work, right? There might not be a map. All right, so we have a person. A list of persons would be people. And so we're expecting a got people is either going to get a result of it failed or it worked. And let's spell that right too. Okay, now in JavaScript, that would be a null pointer exception. In elements, like, dude, you spelled it wrong. I underlined it in red. <laughs> You see, you can see even, even little things that types help a lot with. All right, so now we have our get people, but it's, it's still a little angry. Let's go look at the compile error. So it's expecting us to get a record of type because it wants this guy, right? The actual expect JSON expects two parameters or one if it's a message with some kind of value at it. So we've got people here, right? Or got people message, but the got people is expecting a result of either error or some kind of list of people. You have to decode that. If it fails, you don't have to worry about it. Elm will take care of, okay, I got an error. I will give you an HP error. So it'll parse that part for you. But you have to give it some kind of decoder to say, all right, it didn't fail. I got JSON. You have one last chance to not fail. If the JSON fails, I'm going to say it, it's an HP error of JSON error and tell you why. Maybe it was a particular record. Maybe you spelled ID with a capital I, lowercase d. Who knows? So that people, we've got to decode it. So this is where the JSON decoding comes in. And if you're from JavaScript, you would say, all right, cool. So I can just go like JSON parse, right? I should be good. <laughs> and everything's magical. No, that's not how it works. JSON parse has a ton of problems. Number one, it too can have an error and throw an exception. You would assume an L may give a result. Not the case. You would also assume, okay, well, JSON parse would map it. But what if this changed to got rid of the underscore? Like, how do you know? And what if that property is missing? What do you do? What if that property is there, but it's an empty string? Like you have to figure out all those things. And that's why the JSON parser in Elm can be very overwhelming because all of that's on you. They give you an API that I feel is pretty straightforward enough that they can glean when something went wrong. They can do their best to tell you where, 
the console log formatting needs a lot of work, but it's still better than nothing and better than JSON parse fails. And it's like problem at O line 29, like line 29 O, what does that mean? So let's create a parser here. This is a weird looking function. And you're gonna have to do this like four times until you, you get it, okay? So let's do our people, people parser. So it's red because we haven't implemented it. So we'll put it right below the HTTP. I do that a lot. I'll put like the HTTP stuff and then the parser right below it. And the problem with this is where you start to get into functional programming where it's just functions everywhere. I, I had an interview recently where they said, I don't like functional programming because it's just functions everywhere. At least with classes, you can like have a one-to-one -one relationship with files and find your code. I'm like, that's because you're comfortable with that. In Visual Studio Code, we have this thing called split view. So when you make your code screen bigger, you can actually scroll up to the types and I can reference what a person looks like while I'm writing the parser off to the left. It's just a way of functional programming. You're used to looking at functions. So in an OO code base, this would be a file and then another file, like, and they have a class. It's just the same exact way of working. It's just I'm in one file, you're in two files. And it's no, no different. And some people don't do this. Some people like to put, I do it a lot in JavaScript. I actually put this kind of stuff in files and modules and import those in a node code base, for example, or Go, where you don't have classes. It's the same concept. We're all about modules. But in Elm, and even though Camel code bases like Rescript and F Sharp, it's just common to have you know files that have stuff. You can even put modules in a file if you want. It's kind of a weird syntax. All right, so no parameters. The We're not going to worry about the type in. All you need to do is provide a function that returns a JSON decoder. It's going to use that machine that parsing machine that you build from this function to parse the JavaScript. And one of two things is gonna happen. It's either gonna work or it's gonna fail. Really, really simple. You don't need to worry about all that. You just need to do your best to parse what you think it looks like. So I'm gonna close this temporarily because we kind of know what our person looks like. The only real difference is first name and last name are camel case, wherein our other stuff, it is the Python style of underscore snake case, okay? So we need to map these things. It's a very common thing you do in JSON coding. You map that JSON to yours. So all functional programming is taking an input, give us an output. A lot of times it's called map because you're mapping one thing for another, changing it from one thing to another. You A lot of times you'll think map is array, but in this case we're mapping data. So let's do our JSON import. And there's two types. There's JSON encoder and decoder. We want encode, just kidding, we want decode as JD. And I do JD because I can go JSON decode dot and get all the methods. And if I ever need to encode things, go into like JavaScript, for example, or back to the web, I can go JE for JSON encode rather than importing all the methods because some of the methods are very common, like string and float. It's kind of weird. Things like this can stand alone. We know what an H1 is. We know what a button is as a web developer. But having like string integer, like just floating around, is like, is that a type? It's lowercase? What is going on? So it's just easier to see JD dot string. Oh, right. JSON decoding string. It's just easier to read the code, I think, in my opinion. Which is often wrong. Don't listen to me unless you're inebriated. People parser. So we're going to go JD map. Now map what? Map one, two, three, four. Well, how many properties are we mapping? So it doesn't say that. It just says map. So you're going to have to learn that what the API means is I want to map one, two, three, four, Five. We're going to ignore a page. So I want to map five properties from this JSON object to my Elm type class, type alias, whatever it's called, right? You want to map those two. So you want to map those five, actually, because we're ignoring IP address. So we're going to map five, which means it's expecting six parameters. First, what do you map into? Like, I'll map things for you. I'll look at this object and convert it to this object in the exact order of the slots. But what exactly are you, are you mapping to? because I'm gonna have to make sure the types match. If the ID is, here's a string, and you're expecting an integer, I'm gonna throw an error. I need to know, you know how to connect these things. You need to tell me that. Okay, well, I need you to map five to a person. Cool. So now you have map this thing to a person. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's expecting five more parameters. The first is how do we map ID? Now, I'm going to put this in parentheses. It's a very common thing because each of these functions has parameters and you want to group them together, okay? So each one of these parameters is going to be a function that maps each one of these attributes. So the first one is we're looking for a field. A field is very similar to name value pairs or a property or slot, 
a slot in objects in JavaScript. You're very familiar with this. This is a, a slot. This is also a name. This is also a property, right? They're all the same thing. Properties usually say should oop, but sometimes you have object classes that you map. And so in this case, it's looking for a field. This would be the field, and then you're looking for the value. So name value, field value, same thing. What is the field you're looking for? Field requires two parameters. First, what's the name and what's the type? The name is ID. We're looking for a field on this object called ID. All right, what's its type? What are you expecting? That, when I go looking for this ID, what type should I be looking for? You should be looking for a JSON int. Cool. That's, that's your first one. That's your first parameter. So when you take this parser, it's going to say, all right, you want to map this object I find in this list here to this person. And you want me to say the first parameter is ID. It's an integer. I got to map it to your person's ID of an integer. So that's going to work. That's going to work great. Okay. So the second one, this one should, you, you start and get, get into a rhythm at this point. The second field we're looking for is the first underscore name. That's the name of the field on the object we're looking for. When I give you a JSON object, I want you to find a field called first name and you're looking for a type of JSON string. So it's going to say, okay, so the first name is going to be a string and I'm going to map that to your second slot in your person which will be first name as a string. So it's going to do that one-to-one -one mapping. So you don't have to say, hey, put that in the ID of the person and put this in the first name of the person. It just knows to go in order of the alias. So a lot of times you'll see in JavaScript where they'll say like for loop or for of is not guaranteed in order because they, they can't, right? They can't guarantee the order of an object. In Elm, they do. So we need to find ID, first name, last name. That order matters. And in JSON parsing, it matters too. Over here, there's no, it's not like an array. There's no, it doesn't matter what order you define the ID is. It, it matters in for loops. But when you're just doing a lookup, you're always going to find the ID if you look for the ID. You're always going to find the first name, right? So in this, it, it's a parameter, first parameter, second parameter, so on. So let's do the, the last two, JD, or four, whatever, last name, JD string. And if I misspelled that, like, I don't know if y'all caught it. If I even spelled that, that would fail. Because it doesn't find that Lat's name. Lat's. It doesn't find Lat's name on that particular thing. JD failed. Email. The email is also strings. So these strings are reasonably easy to parse because they're just strings. They map to strings. There's no weird integer math or date or list things you have to do. Gender. Save. Okay, and capitalize the D. Yet again, another bug, Elm fixed, JavaScript wouldn't find. And now it wants the last thing, and that's it's looking for your people parser to parse a list of people, not a single person. And that's what we did. We said people parser is going to get a person and then of JSON and then map it to a person. But that's not what we get at all. This is an array. <laughs> So you need to map it to a list first and then loop through it somehow, right? But there's no loops in functional programming. So what do you do? Well, this is actually not really a people parser. This is a person parser. So let's name it for what it really is. It parses persons. So if I give it a JSON object that looks like a person, if I give it this thing right here, then it'll parse it to a person. But I need to give something else an array and it needs to parse that as an array or a list. You can do either or in Elm. I'm just going to create a list because we don't need to add or look up. We're just going to read from it. So I'm going to say the people parser. And what this is needs to look for the only thing it's going to get is a list. So there's no need to map anything. Like we literally have a list, but that list instead of looking for fields and stuff, each one of those things in a list needs to map using the person parser. So it's going to kind of loop through. Okay, so that gets our basic people parser. So let's, let's review because we've covered a lot. We're trying to make an HTTP call to this JSON, and it gives us an array of JSON objects. Each one of those objects is the same, same shape, and it is kind of modeling a person. It has an ID, first name, last name, email, gender, IP address. We're not going to care about that last property, the IP address. We don't care about that. But we do want to map this to an Elm. So what we've done is we've typed this person 
to have an ID of an integer in every other property is a string. And notice we haven't included IP address. We, we didn't include it. To help differentiate and kind of follow the Elm style and the JavaScript style, we're using camel case on the front end. It helps us debug, it helps us be consistent, and it also helps us differentiate from backend data, which is very common to sometimes have snake case where it has that little underlined thing. So we have a first name and a last name and an email gender. They all match up. The order here matters. When you in, in, instantiate alias, you can do it in two ways. You can do it like person, and you can put ID equals one and first name equals Jesse, but that's, that's one way of doing it. The other way is to treat it like a function and give it parameters that go in the order. So you can say one Jesse. That's another way to do it. And it's important because order matters. Again, functions in Elm are just about everywhere, right? Even in types, they can kind of map to functions. You can use them as functions. So even though they're, they're data, that order matters when you start parsing it. So when we parse things in the back end, we have to tell Elm, this is the order and this is the type to look for. Now, what does that mean by parse? Well, we do an HTTP GET and it gets things. But in Elm, you've got to tell it what to expect. So we're going to expect some JSON back, right? And we're going to say, hey, we got people back. Yay, that message is what you need to send to me when you get it back. Now, messages expect some kind of parameter because expect JSON is going to either not get JSON. It's going to get a, an HTTP error. There's a bunch of things that can go wrong. It could even get the JSON. You could attempt to parse it and it could fail. So there's really two things that can happen when JSON comes back. And that's why in our message up here for our type message, our got people, we have a result. It's one of two things that could happen. A result is just a very similar to a promise. It's either a dot then or dot catch. In Elm, it's either an error of some type, right? In this case, an HP error, or it's data because things worked out well. So if you think of Go, when you call a function in Go, it's either the data or some kind of error. And same with Lua with pcall. This is the same thing in Elm. You either get an error or you get some data back. Cool. How do you get that data back? Well, your responsibility is to give a decoder function, right? It's a function that takes in a bunch of JSON and spits out a bunch of typed objects or fails in some catastrophic way. Good news, you don't have to worry about the fails unless you want to. Most decoders by default will almost try it. And if even something minutely doesn't work, right? Like the last name you actually left out the S, for example, it'll tell you what field was missing what it expected to find. So you first take the top one. I did it backwards to explain it, but we get a list back. And so that decoder says, all right, well, I'm going to get a list back from that JSON, and I need you to map that to another decoder. So the list, every item in that list uses this decoder. Elm kind of assumes, wrongly so sometimes, and, it's, and it's, it'll tell you if it fails, that everything is homogeneous. That means that everything in the array that you get back from the server is the same, the same shape. And that's very, very common. In some document databases, especially when you're doing machine learning or data gathering, that's not always the case. And this is where you need to be very careful or just create a, a back end for front end that kind of cleans and massages the data because that's what Elm expects. It expects every single one of these items to have exactly the same names and exactly the same value types. So it's okay, obviously they have different data, but they all have IDs as integer. They all have first names as strings and they all have the exact same properties spelled the exact same way with like the snake kings, right? So that's kind of what it's expecting. So this list is going to use, because it's assuming that behavior, the same parser for every item in the list. So if you've come from JavaScript, think about array.map. It's going to call that same function on every single item in order of the array. In this case, the parser is going to do the same thing. It's going to get a list back and use that people parser on every item in that array and, and map it. Now, when we say map it, what does that mean? It means take in this JSON object and map five properties in order and basically call the person function with whatever you rip out. So call person with the first parameter is an ID, and it better match this field A, ID better be there. Number two, it better be called ID with the lowercase i, lowercase d. And number three, it better be an integer. If it doesn't match those three things, the whole thing blows up. But if it doesn't, cool, person now gets one on down the line. First name with the underscore name, it's gonna take that string and shove it in the, the second parameter. You'll now have a person, and it's gonna repeat that for every single item in this list all the way down to nine, okay? So that's how decoders work. Now, lastly, when we go to co compilation, you can see it didn't, we didn't handle get people. And see, it doesn't even know if we're gonna use that argument or not. Get people 
will fetch our stuff, but got people really gets a result back. That's what it really is. And we need to handle this. So let's, let's case both. Okay. Cause I want to show you what happens in the error. So we're going to case result of, you could say if, but I just, I want to do case because I want to show you each one of those uh, objects and get them out. So let's handle the error first. You don't have to type error. You can actually do error, right? And we're not really interested in the actual thing that went wrong, but if you wanted to, you could log it out. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because that requires a lot of destruction. All you know is that it just didn't work for a variety of reasons. So if we got an error of some sort, we need to change our model, say it failed. So we'll go back up to our, our model. What are the three possible things that could possibly happen in this app? There's only three, right? Either loading the data, you loaded your people, or they failed. So let's do it. Failed. And what happens when it fails? Nothing. You just sit there and read the message and try to debug it. Nothing else happens in the app. So we're just going to stop. The screen will display some kind of error, I guess. We'll show that later. However, if it worked, it's okay. Then you're going to have some kind of data in there. You're going to have your people. It's going to give you the actual list of people that it parsed from that JSON. And so we're going to say people loaded. Yay. Command none. Now here's the problem. What do we do with that? <laughs> what do we do with those people? Like it's not used. We gotta we want to show it on the screen or something. So let's change our model to allow people loaded to actually have that. So we'll say people loaded and we'll put people. And it's gonna get mad because down here, and let's actually put it there first. There we go. And then on 76 in our view, it's gonna get mad because you didn't actually show it anywhere. And that's okay. Notice we're kind of just ignoring the error. But here we want to show the people. So let me go magically get that table real quick. Okay, it's in my clipboard. And we're going to change the loaded here. We're going to make this a little big because this is going to require a lot of, a lot of surgery here. And we're going to paste it in there. And we're going to fix the tab drama, llama drama. And we're not interested and any data attributes. Let's take that out. Hit save and see where we messed up. Oh, right, people, people. Okay, and we have a table here, but we need to map on the people. And it's gonna say, all right, map. Every person that's in that list, I want you to create a table row. It needs to be the ID, the first one, and the second, is going to be the first name, last name, and email. And we need to import those. So we don't have table TR. We don't have anything for a table. Table TD TR. And what was the other one? This is why you have a compiler, because I'm I don't I don't memorize this stuff. TH. That'll give us our table. Good. Okay. So let's see what else we got. All right, failed. So we start in a failed state. Let's not do that. Let's start in a in a loading state. And actually, let's go back to four. Why not? Let's let's do it. Let's just this is, you reserve the right to change your mind. Fearless refactor. If I want to change code, I I should feel brave to do that because the compiler is going to help me. It's not like TypeScript where you're like, I don't know the compiler engine sand. It's not like or <laughs> my first year with Rescript. I don't know what that's saying. <laughs> like I give up. Make it work. It never works. All right, let's go into our our view real quick and add this new new state here. Div text click the button bruh save and the initial state what do we start in we stayed in ready click the button bruh okay i'll click the button i'll click reload you saw loading happen there for like a second and then it loaded the data and it was good to go and you can see that it loaded everything in there now let's watch what happens when that doesn't work. I'll do it one more time. So we'll say reload, which means that it's currently in a people loaded state with the people that it loaded. I'm gonna click reload, it's gonna go back to loading. So you'll see a loading there for a split second and then it'll show the data again. So that's why even in the reducers, you have the same problem in Redux. You wanna make sure that state in Elm, you might have that problem where you go back to a state and you forget to switch things off. It's just how you type your state. It's a very tricky thing to do. So that's why they always want you to start with your types and model it. But I always, I mean, programming is about fun, right? You want to have fun. And if you enjoy it, if you enjoy the UI, do it. Just understand there's costs of not modeling your types first. All right, so we reload. Let's go back to our parser and break it on purpose. 
So we have down here first name. What happens when I take off first name? And I say, all right, let's go. It failed. Now, it doesn't tell us why because we didn't print out any of the error stuff. But let's print it out. We're not going to actually print it out to the screen in terms of UI. What we're going to do is just print it out to the console. And keep in mind, you can't keep these debug statements in your production code. Elm won't let you to compile it, but it's fun to do when you're there. So, whoa, careful, bro. All right, we're going to say message zero. So I always start with zero and count my way up. So message zero, message one, message two, because if you start nesting lets, it gets confusing, you know, who's shadowing you. So I just kind of ratchet it up. I start start with message zero. Because you have to return stuff. It's not like console.log or print in Python. You don't have to return a value. In Elm, everything's a function. It's all functional. You must return values. For debug, it's like, I don't want to. So I'm just going like, to put the least amount of effort <laughs> into naming those variables, which in this case is message zero. So debug log, I uh, failed to parse Dreshwan. Let's spell it right. Dreshwan. And we'll put the error in there. I think, what did I, what did I call Oh, I put reason. My bad. Reason. Perfect. Okay. Click the button, brah. Clear out the console. Reload. And you can see it failed to parse Dreshwan. Bad body. Oh, I don't know. But I don't know. I don't know who they're talking about. Not this guy. Bad body. Problem with the value at JSON zero. So the first item, when they say JSON zero, they mean the first first index of the array you get. And the formatting they try <laughs> with new lines, it doesn't come out in Chrome or Firefox very well. But you can see it's mad because the first name here is first name Iris, and it was expecting a object, which it got an object. You can we can see there's an object here. This this looks like an object. It's expecting an object with the field name of first name. Now there's, there's nothing in here called first name. It's first with a T, right, right there. And so you'll see these kind of errors. This is why I like the no holds barred very strict way because once you parse it correctly, you know it works. That makes you feel really good. But debugging this kind of stuff can be very painful when you start having large amount of objects and it's not always the first item. So for example, when you pull from NoSQL databases, you could have item eight or 800 that has a failure. It's just very frustrating. So you start to learn about how do I make the decoder a little more flexible, right? And you can, you can delve into that. But that is the basics of how you get your, let's undo that. We'll keep our, actually, you know, we'll keep our error in there. Let's go to our, change it again, first name. Reload. All right, so, so that's the basics of doing a JSON decoder. And that should give you a general idea of something I found the hardest thing to do in Elm because it uses a lot of concepts. You have to know everything about Elm. You have to really really go through the Elm guide. So if you go to Elm Lang, if you've never done this, Evan and all the people who write it are adamant about that. And I agree. It took me a bunch of read-throughs, though, to read the guide, to really get it. Once you get down to HTTP, notice it's separate from JSON because HTTP getting text is completely different than JSON. But I would argue that 99% of what us web developers in Elm do, a lot of us, we're not dealing with text. We're dealing with JSON, building enterprise systems, getting JSON back from systems, having to parse it. It's not always happy JSON. It's not homogeneous, right? And so you have to know all this other stuff <laughs> to, to do the basics of JSON parsing. It's not like JavaScript where you're like, JSON parse, I'm a rock star, right? And he, Elm, it's like, have a message and blah, blah. So let's review that stuff just so we're on the same page. Because I know it's a lot. So we have a, a main app, a basic browser app. And the difference around most of the apps is we're doing Element. So Sandbox, you start with browser of Sandbox, and it's just, there is no subscriptions. It's in it, you start with a model, and that's it. You have a view that shows that model, and your update is whenever you click on anything, and like buttons and stuff. That's it. Once you start doing HTTP stuff and having side effects like that, you have to do a basic browser element, okay? Element implies that you have an element on the page, and that's fine. But really, it's all about having a subscriptions that for now does nothing because we're not listening to time. We're not listening to things. It's just a step in a direction of how they optimize the DOM and the message signatures change because now your update is expecting a, a message back and a model, right? So you have to say, all right, after something happened in my app, a user clicks something, an HTTP come back, I have a new model, cool, just like Redux, but I also have a command that may happen. So for example, somebody clicks a button. Hey, somebody clicked a button. Oh, really? Is it the refresh button? Cool, I'm glad you 
glad you let me know because I need you to go load some HTML now that you click that button. And so this allows you to change the model, say, now I'm loading. I'm going to load the HTML before I actually do it. I've loaded the HTML. I have a result. It could have worked or not. What would you like that model to be now? Here's some data if it worked. Here's an error if it didn't work. What, what, was the, what, what should we show in the, the model? At that point, the view can say, all right, I got it from here. I'll show the bad stuff or I'll show the good stuff. Right? It's really up to you. So the update changes and the init changes a little bit where you might have like a flag from the UI to pass in like a random seed or number or something like that. But really it's, what do we start with? Like, what does our model start? What's the state when I, what is the first thing I see on the screen when I load your app? That's what init is supposed to do. I'm supposed to be ready and I do nothing. Now you could, you could in, in command, you could load people here and just start, you know, the app loading up. That could work because then when you load the app, you see the people. But we wanted to click the button to initiate it. I feel like you have some kind of control and learn. So we're going to say, when you start up, do nothing. Now, how do we model that state? We do that in the model by saying, we're going to start in ready state. We're good. There's four states of, I'm ready. I'm loading the people. The people loaded failed. The people loaded worked. That's modeling the state of your app. And this model can, often in bigger apps, is always a record. But for a small app, you can just make it a nice little enum and call it a day. And notice the type Right? It's, it's, a, it's an actual type, like an enumeration. It doesn't have an alias. You can't instantiate it. It's, it's a, one of these, okay? It can never only be one of these at one time. However, our alias, what we're loading from the server, is people. It's a thing you can instantiate, like a class instance. And a people is just another way of saying list person. So I could have written list person, right, everywhere, but I like having the word, one word people, and we know what that means, and it's strongly typed. Because you could have a deck of cards that could also be a list of people on it, like the Jack Queen, right? The, the one from like Alice in Wonderland. But they're very different people, right? They're like weird cards with weapons and suits and things like that. It's very strange. So this helps differentiate those in our heads, very clearly different. But in code, it's like, it's a list of people. No, 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 no. Completely different list of people. And it's one variable name you can type, right? Instead of saying list person. Because then you start adding parentheses everywhere like this. And it just gets annoying. How do we model that person that's a list of people? That person, we kind of cheated by looking at the JSON. We said, well, it's basically the same thing, but not written like Python, right? The JavaScript version of this would be like this, right? It's an ID that's an integer, first name, last name, email, gender, they're all strings. And we're just going to ignore IP address because we don't care, right? So that's, that's our person. That's our, our type that we modeled for our person. Now, what can your app do? We've modeled our state. We've initiated how it starts. What can it do? Well, it can do nothing, right? I, you, I always like leaving no op in there just in case. It's, it's good to like say, all right, if I click this, I want to make sure it can do nothing. I want to click this, make sure the, the, the stuff looks good. Because sometimes the CSS, you kind of get intermingled of designing versus developing. And so it's good to have like a no op to say, all right, let's just see how the button looks because maybe code redo something and I don't know that. So for larger LMAPs, there's a lot of different states you can be in. If you have a no op, it's like, all right, let me just not break the CSS. Let me, let me focus on the CSS and ignore all functionality. So no ops are helpful. The second thing we can do is get people. We can go to the server and get people. That's when you click the refresh button. So this is what your app can do. These are messages. These are action creators if you're from Redux. Got people is when the HTML comes back. So that message isn't initiated by a user. That's initiated by Elm. So Elm will let you know when those people go back. So if you're used to using promises, you control that. You go promise that there. You go promise that catch. You put your own functions in there. Elm is just going to call a message and it's your responsible to handle that, right? So it's very similar to promise. It's just defined in two places instead of one because there are no side effects. So that got people could have a ton of things that go wrong. Each, the web server could be down. Your JSON parsing could fail. There's a variety of reasons. So it's going to give you a result that contains one of those two things. If it's a result that failed, it'll have your error in it. But if it succeeded, it'll have your parsed data, in this case, people. Well, how does it get that parsed data? Well, let's look at the load people. It's going to go to this API gateway URL that I created that just throws back, it calls a Lambda that spits back predefined JSON, right? That's all it does. And when we get it back, we have to define what do we expect back? And this is where Elm strictness really throws us off. And it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around. But think of expect requiring two things, okay? Not three. I know it looks like three, but think two things, okay? The first is, what are you expecting back? 
99% of us are always going to do expect JSON, but occasionally you could expect a string. You could expect, I don't care. It's called whatever, right? You don't really care. It's just as long as it's an HP 200 or 201 or 200 something or 300 something, we're good, <laughs> right? We don't, as long as it's not 400 or 500, we're okay, right? And that's what expect, not whatever would be, but expect JSON is we need some JSON back and we need to parse it. Okay. If I get JSON, so it, it we don't have a network problem. We don't have a latency problem. We got an HTTP response back. It's in the 200 range and it has some kind of data in there. What do you want me to do? I'm Elm. I would like to help you, the programmer. The programmer's like, cool. Tell me that I got a people. Okay. I'm going to give you a result back. I'll give you an HTTP error since you're using a result in this context. But if I get data and it's JSON, like you need to help me parse it. Oh, okay. So what do you need me to do? I need you to tell me how to decode this JSON. Okay, I can do that. And so you give it a function. This function is going to create that decoder. It's not actually going to get JSON and then spit back data. That's not how it works. You give it a decoder, a list of instructions on how to convert that JSON, and it'll spit it back. So this people parser says, cool, I'm going to get a list. Right there, see this list, this list of JSON objects? I'm going to get a list. And for each one of these items, I want you to call the people parser, just like JSON map. Okay. And it'll say the people parser will get that object and map it for five fields. Even though there's six, we're gonna ignore that one because we don't want it. Our person just so happens to have five fields, right? ID, first name, last name, email, gender. And so you have to define each one of those fields in order. Because remember, you can go new person, like, a, like a, from an object-oriented program, programming perspective, you go new person, and the constructor would have those properties like ID, first name, last name. In Elm, it's the same way. You can treat it like that. You don't have to give it a record. You could go one, Jesse, right? And so it's going to do that for you, but you need to map it. So I'm going to map, hey, look for that field in that object, map it, look for the ID, and it's supposed to be an integer. If it's an integer, great. Put it as the first parameter to person. Fantastic. Keep going down the line for first name, last name, email, dinner. Once you have all those, you're good. You can determine which one you got in the update. Once it came back, what did it come back with? It's a result. So it's one of two things. You have to case on it or if, or whatever. I'm going to do case because I like case. So either it's an error, and we'll tell you the reason why, and if you're interested, you can debug it. You can also convert those to errors to show your user if they're appropriate. Otherwise, you can say, like, it failed. I'm sorry. It didn't work. Try again later. Or you could retry for them using a task, for example. In this case, we just say it failed. And so we show failed on the screen. Not very helpful, but it's more for the developer, not really for the user. If it worked, cool, we got some people. So we're going to say people loaded and hand that off to that type because that type requires, if you look at that type, you hold command key or control on Windows and you can see people loaded requires a people, a list of persons, right? A list of persons. So when we get this state, we're going to have our data right there as a second parameter. We can case it out. So we're going to say, cool, our model is a list of people that works. We're good to go. And both of these result in just showing the error or showing the data. We're not doing any commands. We're just doing command none and done. And so that's why when it works, you see a list of people. In the screen. So again, that's how you do JSON decoders in Elm using the basics, right? We're not doing any custom failures. We're not doing any enum types. I'll show those in a later video. But this should get you started on, I think, the most important thing to learn in Elm to really be productive and build apps in it. And that is making web service calls that you can parse JSON. Once you have this, everything else is the impossible world of accurately typing your domain and solving race conditions, which if you solve, you'll get the Nobel Peace Prize and I'll be your best friend forever. So if you got any other questions, let me know. Again, my name is Jesse Warden. You can ask some comments. I'm on Twitter. I'm Jester Excel. Send me an email. I will do my best to respond within time. I hope that helps and I hope that gets you inspired to learn Elm and befriend the compiler, right? Refactor without fear. You saw how we did that. It should help you out. If not, you can log those things out and look at the console and see where your JSON Good luck.